Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to talk to you about behavior and how organisms respond to their environment. Now, just to point something out that it's a combination in behavior in, in the genetic contribution and the environmental contribution. And so I want to emphasize today in this particular video environmental influences on behavior. And when I say environmental influences, I want to further emphasize the sort of abiotic factors in the environment because environmental influences could be also responding to other organisms. Okay, so this is going to be a look at sort of abiotic factors. And so let's jump right into that discussion. So how about this? Say you had a some sort of dish, some sort of like petri dish, and, and we're going to call it a choice chamber. <laughs> How about that? And we're going to put inside of it some little tiny bugs, let's say some wood lice. <laughs> How about that? And over on this one side over here, over on the right side, it's going to have a wet environment and over here a, a sort of an arid environment. So dry and wet. And as it turns out, can these little wood lice make a choice on what environment they prefer? And if they do choose, can they, can they use their behavior to influence their movement, if you will? And so these are some of the things that we're going to talk about. I, I think you could relate to this. Like, for example, again, on a larger scale, we're going to talk about movement in terms of when it gets really cold, organisms might want to hibernate, or if it gets really cold out and, uh, and the water is cold, maybe whales will start to migrate. So we're going to talk about these movements, if you will. Uh, and so I just want to also point out something that not only do genetics and the environment contribute to a behavior, but the responses that organisms have in terms of behavior can be, can be behavioral, okay, and physiological. So we're going to mostly consider behavioral responses to the environment, but also a couple of examples of physiological as well. So the first type of, of uh, behavior in response to the environment is something called kinesis. Now, just as the word implies, kinesis means movement, but it's interesting. It's a simple change in activity. It doesn't even have to be dramatic movement. It could be like turning response, or it could actually be inactivity. That could be an example like not moving. And so uh, a great organism to work with instead of wood lice is the little tiny roly poly. Sometimes the roly poly is called a sow bug. And as it turns out, uh, when you're experimenting with it over here, if you give it sort of like your choice chamber, if you give it different environments, like dry soil versus wet soil, I wonder what would happen to it. And actually, as it turns out, the roly-poly, as you might expect, likes moist soil. And so if it likes something, it's going to be more likely to stay put. In other words, it's not going to be moving around. It's going to be less active in moist areas. And so as it turns out, if it's in a dry area, it's, it, it's frustrated with that. And so it'll just start randomly turning and moving and becoming very active. And so kinesis has to do with just random movement with the hope that perhaps you'll find some place that you like and then you'll settle down. How about that? And so now this is in contrast to taxis. And I always think of taxis as being something like if I want to go to the airport, I will call a taxi and I'll tell the, the driver, please take me to the airport. In other words, it's, it's an oriented mo motion. It's oriented movement, meaning that if I want to go toward the light or if I want to go toward the popcorn <laughs> or I want to go away from the skunk. So there's different environmental cues. There could be things like pH or there could be light. It could be temperature. It could be a number of things. And so it's based on environmental cues that trigger the movement. And so it's, the organism is responding. It's, it's using its senses to take in the environment 
and it's saying I've got to move toward that or I've got to move away from that. So it's an oriented movement toward or away from a, a stimulus. And so, for example, you can have fish that have a positive taxis, meaning that they observe the, cu the current in the river and they swim uh, against it. So they're swimming upstream or with it depends on what the what the situation is but they're going to respond to the environment and so um, in this aquarium right here you can see these little tiny pink eyes are these little crustaceans called brine shrimp and you can do a really clever experiment with the brine shrimp you can put them in a clear plastic tube let me get this a little bit lo larger so you can see it if you put brine shrimp in a tube and you put of course cork on both sides and, and some salt water in here. They'll be able to swim back and forth, back and forth. And if you were after a period of time, say like, I don't know, maybe an hour, if you decided to clamp them off like this. And so if this was a meter long and you clamped them three times, what you'd actually have is four sections. Okay. And then if you were to take those uh, brine shrimp out and you count them up, how many are in section one, section two, three, and four, well, if this is all you're doing is putting shrimp in a tube and you're not applying any treatment whatsoever, you might think that, you know, all things being equal, there's probably 25% in each of these tubes. And that's probably the case. That's what you your, uh, your expect your results to be. But if you were to apply some sort of treatment, in other words, some environmental cue, let me sort of help it out a little bit. Let's just say that you were doing over on this side, you are applying some sort of uh, light source like this. And so the light is shining down. And then over here, you had maybe an opaque sleeve and it made it really, 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 really dark, maybe total darkness. And then even over here, you could use a screen and do a little bit of light. And then over here, a lot more, maybe two screens over here. So it's a gradient. And so then you could let them swim, swim, swim. And then you could test to see how many there are in different sections to sort of see if they're responding to photo taxis. So in other words, light. Or you could set up a different experiment, whatever you wanted to do. You could look at chemicals or, or chemo taxis. You could see if they're responding to different pH. Perhaps on one side, you could do it like this. You can make one side acidic and the other side basic over on this side. And so you would be considering pH going from 1 to 7 to 14. And then you could sort of graduate it this way. And so one could look at taxis. Again, it's influenced by the environment. And so you could look at temperature. In other words, you could set, like, look at this. This is kind of interesting. Say you had fish in this aquarium, and you were able to section it off or somehow control the fact that it's cold on one side and, and warm on the other side, let the fish swim, beep, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Now, if you didn't do any temperature you'd put in, and you, you were to partition them off into one, two, three, four, five sections, you might expect it to be like 20% each. But if you were to then close it off and then count them up and look at this, well, check it out. It seems like not so many, a lot, section C and then not so many. It almost looks like a bell-shaped curve. Do you see this? Kind of looks like that in terms of the number of fish in versus temperature like this in celsius and so interesting so behavior this is a great example of taxis and so they're able to they don't seem to like the cold they don't seem to like the, the warms they seem to like it in the middle and so they're responding to environmental factors and Here's the, here's the punchline to the whole thing. Why do organisms respond to environmental factors this way in terms of their movement? It's because natural selection is encouraging a behavior that will take the organism into a place where it's, where it's most suited to survive and then have offspring. And so natural selection is influencing this. But it's not just temperature and, and pH and light. You ready for this? Like sometimes behavior is influenced by environmental signals from the outside. And even sometimes uh, in terms of uh, timing, in terms of rhythms, but it, it even comes from their influence, their behavior by internal rhythms as well. 
Okay, so let's check this out. Some animals are affected by an internal rhythm called a circadian. So that circa means a circle, so around a day. So 24 hours, so sometimes behaviors cycle in a 24 hour period. Interesting, between rest and activity. Sometimes behaviors such as migration, and we'll get into this in a moment, are linked to changing of seasons. I alluded to this earlier, when in the winter time or in the summertime, there'll be big movement. And those are circa annual rhythms, like based upon like a seasonal cycle. And then some behaviors are linked to the moon. It's a lunar cycle. So how do you, about, how do you like that? So about a month, there, the behavior changes. And an example of this is this courtship ritual in fiddler crabs. And they do this during um, the new and the full moon. <laughs> I, I know it's hard to imagine, but this is when they do their courtship ritual, new and full moons. So it's a lunar cycle. So you see this male here with the big claw? What do you suppose it's doing? It has one big claw, sort of like a fiddle. And it's really weird. It's sort of, it, they could use it for a couple of purposes. They can like intimidate other males with it or fight other males, like aggressive behavior. Or they could sort of wave females over into their nest. They're like, come on over here. <laughs> and so when the female, this is funny, the, the female goes into the nest, into the burrow, then it uses the big claw and like shoves sand in there in order to sort of keep her in so that it can, can mate with her. <laughs> funny. So migration, this is a big one. Everyone loves migration. Let me make a recommendation to you. If you ever wanted to watch a great documentary on birds migrating. It's called Winged Migration. It, it's really, really interesting. Some tremendous photography, winged migration. So this is long distance change in location. This is not like little swimming or roly poly staying under a, a, a wet rock. This is, we're talking about like big distances, like massive kilometer uh, changes in their in their movement. And now how do they do that? How do they orient their, their, their position? In other words, how do they know how to migrate? So they're all flying along. Like, how do they know how to do this? Well, there's a lot of speculation about this. And so there's some camps that think that they use the position of the sun and so in order to uh, determine where they're going. Some suggest, some research suggests that they use this circadian clock that is internal and it affects their ability to migrate. Some believe that it's genetically determined and there's some studies versus um, juveniles, uh, birds sort of know internally where to go, but yet they also learn their migration route as they get older as well. So there's a lot of factors at play, but I find these last two to be very interesting. Sometimes, uh, scientists think that the birds use the position of the stars, like for example, at night to guide them. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Especially the North Star, they're able to focus on that. But then again, that breaks down when you, when you consider that it's not always a clear night. And so they can't always use the stars as navigation. And sometimes birds make it there anyway when it's cloudy and it's like, uh-oh. What's going on there? Now we, we believe there's strong evidence suggests that it's really the magnetic field of the earth that they're using as a, as a means of determining direction. And it's like, how can they determine this? Well, their sensory perception is different than ours, obviously, birds and such. And so we believe that sometimes some of these birds have magnetic properties in their, in their head and they're able to be able to determine whether or not the orientation in their migration. It's kind of interesting. If you wanted to read more about that, it's interesting. So another behavior in response to the environment is most people understand the idea of hibernation. I'll talk about it in a second, but this uh, estivation is a really interesting one. It's sort of in contrast to that. It's a inactive state, sort of like hibernation, but it's in response to very hot climate as opposed to cold climate. So in the deserts of Australia, there's a, there's a couple of cool examples of this, but I just decided to pick one. There's estivation can occur in crocodiles and snails, but 
but this frog is just too much. I can't even believe it. There's frogs that when it does rain, there is a moment where it rains and then it sort of floods because the, the soil's really dry. What the frog does is that it soaks up like a sponge, a tremendous amount of water and it becomes swollen and then it burrows down under the ground and it cocoons itself under the ground. And what it does is that it goes into like this coma state, this inactivity, and it can actually stay there for literally months and months and months and months until it rains again, and then it's able to come out. It's an absolutely incredible res behavioral response to environment. And of course, there's hibernation. Hibernation is when, you know, an organism's again going into this inactive state for a long period of time. So what's weird about hibernation is that you know every living animal on the earth is burning energy like physical activity walking around you know, breathing burns energy pumping blood burns energy digesting food burns energy so warm-blooded animals uh you know use a lot of energy just to keep their t their temperature as as they need it and so this is kind of an unusual thing here's an example of a door mouse and it's curled up and it can stay there in a hibernated state in the winter time for up to six months until the temperature warms up and it comes out. Now this is a little unusual because, you know, the main reason for an organism to eat is to gain energy and also to get chemical nutrients to, to grow, but for energy. And so the system works fine when there's plenty of food around, okay, when there's lots of fruit or there's a lot of, a lot of prey around, but in the winter time, so this is a behavioral adaptation to environment. In the winter time, often there isn't a lot of food. And so it's difficult. So animals need to be able to use behavior to get through that. And so how they do it is that they hibernate. Like for example, these bears are hibernating over here. And so hibernation is like this state of suspended uh, animation where they're breathing, uh, their heart rate slows down and their, their body temperature slows down. Um, and then in most cases, they stop eating and they stop urinating and they stop ex excreting waste. It's, it's pretty unbelievable and thus using less energy. Also, I want to talk about how an animal's behavior reacts to the environment by simply environment, meaning like nighttime and daytime. So maybe some of you are familiar with this nocturnal behavior is means nighttime behavior as opposed to diurnal behavior which is daytime so this is behavioral response to environmental cues like day and night behavior um, you know we're, we're a daytime organism but there's many examples of animals that are nocturnal and many animals that are nocturnal nocturnal uh, behave at night like owls and bats are nocturnal and you can see that they have special adaptations that allow them to thrive at nighttime, like owls have these tremendous nighttime vision that help them see in the dark. And so other organisms, like for example, these lemurs have special um, imp impressive eyes that allow them to see in the dark. And even things like bats, who don't see very much at all, they use echolocation. So these signals that are out, that permeate out from the from the bat and then they ricochet back and so the, and the back can determine how close an object is without even seeing it. And so things like rabbits, for example, have great hearing, so they don't need to see as well. And so finally, in terms of responding to the environment, there's some uh, behaviors that are more physiological than mechanisms than, than anything else. And what I mean by that is, for example, when it's really cold out, you ever notice that your skin gets goosebumps like this, or goose flesh, it's sometimes called. Um, it's inside the dermis of your skin, which is the true skin. We have this outer layer called the epidermis, which is really thin. But in the dermis, we have little smooth muscles that attach to the hair follicles. This is a hair cross-section, these sebaceous gland that makes oil. So here's the dermis. Do you see this, this red line right there? This is the erector pili muscle that helps lift the hair up and if the hair stands up it allows for the air closest to the skin to be trapped and that's where the heat is coming from from the skin obviously and so it'll sort of keep 
the air warm if it traps the air and therefore it'll warm us down. And now, of course, we don't have that much hair, but for organisms that do have a lot of fur and a lot of hair, this is a really important uh, adaptation. Sometimes an animal will even use that fluffed up fur, for example, to look intimidating. And so that's, that's for a different purpose or if, when it's frightened, if you will. And then, of course, you, may, you know this, like when it's very, very warm out, our body secretes using its sweat gland, which is an exocrine gland that releases water to the outside. And when water appears on the out of, outside of our skin, it's the warmest water molecules that evaporate, leaving the cooler ones behind, giving us a sensation of cooling. So that's a physiological response to the environment. And also shivering is a neurological uh, result which influences our muscles to be able to twitch, which generates friction and then warms us up as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video on how organisms use behavior uh, to respond to environmental cues. Thanks for watching.